Se podría parar este visto, no te un poco si me la has visto. No te da el descanso de decir. A la hora de un mal de volar. Ya que ni huele. Tu adrina paro. موسیقی خدا ولی مکتب نوی دغدغه نیل دکابر دنبی پسیز من کور کنیشته. حالا پسی خانی. هر چه So in this concluding panel, we want to discuss what impact is, the results that you achieve, and what makes them sustainable, what makes them lasting for the children like the ones we've just seen in the video. Do you achieve sustainability through global reach by engaging the local communities or by educating the new generation? Aurora is doing a little bit of all of that through its laureates and designated organizations as well as its gratitude scholarships, which give at-risk youth from the greater Middle East and North Africa who've been affected by conflict, displacement and poverty, the opportunity to get world-class international education. So let me introduce the panelists for our third session. Over on my right, we've got Tom, Tom Katena, physician, Mother of Mercy Hospital in the Nuba Mountains. As I'm sure you all know, he was the 2017 Aurora Prize Laureate. Next to him, we have Umra Omar. She was the 2016 CNN hero, UWC Atlantic alumni, 
2000-2002, and she's founder of Safari Doctors. On my left, I've got Philip Rosler, CEO of the Hainan Sihang Foundation and a former vice chancellor of Germany. And next to him, Mike van Krovenberg, director of the Fondation de Grand Duc de la Grande Duchesse in Luxembourg. And they were recipients of funds from the first year laureate, uh, one of the designated organizations. <coughs> So what is impact and what makes it sustainable? Well, first of all, I'd like to ask Tom to just give us a little thumbnail sketch of his work and the kind of impact that he's hoping to create through it. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Katina. I'm the medical director and surgeon at the Mother of Mercy Hospital in the Numa Mountains of Sudan. Uh, Numa Mountains are located in the Republic of Sudan. We're in the north and we're in a rebel-held territory involved in civil war since 2011 against the government of Khartoum, which is headed by uh, the indicted war criminal Omar Hassan al-Bashir. Uh, our work is, uh, is uh, we have a 435-bed referral hospital, we're the only referral hospital for the entire region. Uh, we also have six clinics that we, that we operate. Um, we've been in, in, in operations since uh, March 2011, or 2008, sorry. Um, our work is mostly in, in curative and preventive medicine. Um, and the question was on impact. What and well, you're obviously doing very difficult and dangerous work there yeah. in actually just treating people. Right, so if you want to, I mean, the word impact, uh, I think for us, uh, impact is something very straightforward. You're a surgeon, we go and do an operation, we see the impact of our, of our work immediately. The person either lives or dies, we see what the outcome is. Uh, same with the medical patients in the wards, we see the impact almost immediately. Um, another area, of course, is with present preventive services. Uh, just to give an example, uh, with the impact of immunization, when the Civil War broke out in, in June 2011, uh, the international group that's responsible for providing vaccinations stopped providing vaccines to the mountains. That's June 2011. Three years later, uh, 2014, we had a huge uh, measles epidemic <coughs> in Nuba. So we saw 1,400 measles cases just at our hospital alone with the death of 30 children uh, during about a six-month period. So I think if you look at impact of, of immunizing people, the reverse is also true. If you don't do your job, you see the results, which is 1,400 uh, cases, 30 deaths of, of children. Um, so since that time, we've made efforts to get vaccines. We've immunized uh, the majority of the population in the mountains. So. Now, Umra, what, what is it that made you and come back to your native Kenya? I mean, what was your goal in starting Safari Doctors? Well, with the starting Safari Doctors, it was like an accidental um, uh, initiative. I was actually home on vacation only to find out that during that time is when the tourism activities were rampant in Lamu, which borders Somalia very closely. And so at that point when uh, NGOs were getting out and uh, partners were stopping their programming, is where I found the need that, you know, if I'm here and this is where I'm from, then this is an opportunity for us to actually go in. So that was, you know, people, when one um, void is created, is that it was actually a platform that could be very detrimental to the communities that would be filled in by um, the military and militant presence. So that was where we chose to jump in. Now, on, on my left, I have Philip. Philip Rosler. Now, the HNA group has a number of socially responsible initiatives, you ranging from cultural and artistic support to alleviating poverty. Now, tell me a bit about the foundation uh, and what you would see as your core impact goal. So the HNA group had re indeed in, in the past some charity work, cultural support as well. Now they created the Sihang Foundation based in New York. We have a dedicated mission which means we would like to empower people through education, entrepreneurship, and health. Mm -hmm. And as such, we're working together with a major international organizations, other foundations, because we don't have any people on the ground in the field, but we are purely a grant-making foundation. Okay. So, for example, we have a project with UNESCO to empower young women in Africa and Asia. So, but they are running this project, 
and we are the donors. So you're the ones that are helping, you're, you're giving the money, you're enabling these projects on the ground, on the ground. to get going and to, yeah. to keep going, hopefully. Mike, um, tell us about your foundation and, and your impact goals, what you do and what you're trying to do in the future. Yes, we have uh, two major activities. Uh, the first, uh, as the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess are the sovereign of Luxembourg, takes place in Luxembourg in form of uh, social aid and integration of people and uh, with a focus on people that encountered a very difficult economic situation. And the second activity uh, lies in, um, in human humanitarian aid in a developing country. And um, the common goal that we have, the impact that we search is uh, to enable people to help themselves. And besides these two activities, uh, we are organizing uh, major events in Luxembourg on uh, specific topics. For instance, uh, we are now preparing an international conference which will take uh, place next year in March uh, to end uh, violence, sexual violence in uh, conflict zones and in uh, refugee camps. Mm -hmm. And um, we are working together with the Dr. Mugwege Foundation and with the organization of uh, we are not weapons of war. And the impact here, of course, is uh, to sensitize on the topic in the first place. Then, uh, to to bring... spread awareness, yes? Yes, mm -hmm. to spread awareness, which is uh, the, the basic. Mm -hmm. But um, on a more concrete uh, level, we, we try to bring the, the people together, the stakeholders which are really interested in the team, to, to work together and to, to find solutions together. And then in the, in the third place, and this is um, maybe the most important to to find practical solutions. I know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Luxembourg is a finance place. We have a certain uh, experience in fintech. Uh, we are developing more and more experience in social investment. And uh, this can be very useful for the resilience of uh, the, the victims. Now, how do you quantify the impact of humanitarian work? Uh, is it by the trust that you earn in local communities? Uh, how do you do that, Tom? Can, perhaps you could tell us how, what you're aiming to do in that way. How, how do you quantify what you do? Well, right, I think for us uh, in the medical profession, it's a little bit straightforward. I think we are able, able to measure our impact or results by, by just the numbers. So we have, you know, we know how many patients we're seeing. We see 130,000 outpatients in a year, we do 2,000 operations, um, we do 2,500 ultrasounds. So I think in that respect, just by the numbers, we can say, okay, we have this amount of money coming in, these are the numbers we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, is it also about training local staff? It's sort of spreading out the effect, you know, <coughs> using that money in the best possible way? Right, so we have, uh, our goal is to get all of our staff uh, officially trained. We started the hospital in 2008, we had a few expatriates from Kenya and Uganda, all the newest staff were on the job trained. I think mm -hmm. the, uh, probably the most senior person had an eighth grade education. Uh, we trained them all on the job. They were start with 15. Uh, now we have a good number of staff who have been to nursing school, been to clinical officer school that we've sent what out for training. What sort of numbers do you have now? You started with 15 and you've got what now? Now we have uh, 230 staff mm. uh, altogether. I mean, that includes well, cleaners and everybody else. But, yeah. <laughs> In my book, anyway. Yeah. Um, Umra, you're a startup. Um, you know, and your uh, approach is very unique. Is it difficult to find the right benchmarks to, to measure the success of your work against? It's actually a nightmare, mm -hmm. and I think some of my least favorite words are impact and sustainability, yep. which is something that we you have. You can talk about results and lasting, because people understand those words. So when we're talking of uh, what we're keen on is what's the impact of our impact, and I think that's something that's usually um, missed in the work that we do. I'm just giving an example. We have a youth ambassador program, which is about enabling young people within their communities so that they can be the tentacles of health education and changing mindsets. And you have a donor coming in. They're like, okay, this youth is supposed to be helping eradicate bed bugs in their community. You know, like, how many bed bugs have they eradicated? And you're like, I think we're missing the point. Mm -hmm. It's how has this young man or woman improved their self-esteem? You know, somebody who started the program and they couldn't even look at you in the face. How have they gotten community buy-in? So there's a journey to impact, which is what I think is the biggest challenge for us, is how do we um, capture the results of the journey as opposed to the output? And do you think that's different from the way other NGOs approach it? I think it's absolutely different. We are dealing in a world that has a metric system that's um, very theoretically based as opposed to 
qu uh, qualitative, it's more quantitative. And uh, given that we come from communities that are more about storytelling, that are more visual, um, yet you get, you know, like this 20 page agreement with check boxes. So that's where our challenge is. Yeah, and that's just not going to make sense, is it, to the kind of people? It's not that we're flying to help. very well right now, no, but we're okay. working on it. Um, Philip, um, you talked about education mm -hmm. and you talked about entrepreneurship as being absolutely critical to your, to your approach. So um, how, how do you do that? What are good examples of, of both, both those areas that you're engaged in where you can, you believe, have impact? I mean, I, agree, I, I understand you're not on the ground, but you're obviously receiving reports back, you, you, there is a way to measure what you do. Yeah, exactly. Since we're a new, newly born foundation, so we have a the lucky situation to define for ourselves from the very early beginning, what is our understanding of having impact? Maybe the first level, which is not totally a hierarchy, but the first level is certainly to improve individual lives. You can count them, you can measure them, and what you mentioned, if you're working together with major international organizations, as UN entities, you receive a lot of numbers and figures in their annual reports. Mm -hmm. The second is, and that was just was mentioned, is more to change a mindset a cultural approach and talking about refugees and entrepreneurship, which maybe sounds on the first view sort of weird, but it's not. Because yes, you can have a refugee, can, you can support them with meals. We have a project together with the World Food Program called 30 Million Meals, very countable. But at the same time, you can try to educate even young refugees, for example, in coding, that's one of the projects we like to support, so that they can take their own life into their own hands and having a mindset change out of being waiting for donations but really starting some entrepreneurship on your own. Yeah, and we all know that refugees have been the lifeblood of many um, societies. Yeah. America, for example, with the Armenian uh, refugees that came and became successful entrepreneurs. And I think what's interesting also from the Aurora Index is that people are fearful uh, of refugees taking their jobs, taking their, uh, their health service, taking their facilities. But if those refugees become entrepreneurs and they create jobs, then perhaps we can lessen the suspicion about them in, in the wider public. But that leads to another discussion because <clears throat> that means at the same time, yes, you should improve the life of the refugees in the regions, in the camps, but at the same time, you should have in mind not to create any imbalance with the society around. Otherwise, the effect will be exactly you would not have, so you would not like to have. So I think what you do need is to have your single project, but at the same time to talk with others around this as well, which fits into the perspective into society. Because the mindset change is the individual mindset change, but also in the environment, so that you don't have them only in camps, but try to bring them into the normal society of a country, of the host country. At the same time to talk with the people in the host country, that they are more an opportunity rather than a threat to their economic situation, to their job situation, and so forth. So it's way more to having this kind of impact, and that leads to the third level of um, having impact, which is a so-called system change. To change, to influence, to impact an entire system. That would be, from my understanding, the most fulfilling impact you can achieve well, as an institution. Well, that's a very, very big foundation. subject, isn't it? But, you know, worth oh, striving for. Exactly. M Mike, you're, you're, you know, you're based in Luxembourg, but you provide funding around the world to realize projects internationally. You know, what difficulties do you face evaluating the effectiveness of those, of those projects? Well, if it comes to very uh, small projects and uh, short term, it is, uh, of course, very difficult. Could you just put your mic a bit closer to your mouth? That's close, good. okay. That's good. But uh, we have an excellent uh, uh, experience with Maggie um, Barankitsu with the Maison Shalom. We work with them since uh, 2009. And uh, you mentioned the word of trust before. And uh, of course, you, you, you need the figures, you need uh, to, to see what happens on the, on the quantitative basis, but then you need to, to see what's happening, and you need to feel. And then you have to go on the field and, to, and to, 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 to check it out yourself. And what we saw and we see what happened in, uh, in Burundi and now in Rwanda is just yes. amazing. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, other examples from your, from your widespread? I mean, obviously, you talk about two African well, countries there. You, you see, as I said before, um, the, the main objective is uh, to enable people to have themselves. So if you take people out of the, the camp and you educate them, 
and uh, you send students to universities. And afterwards, you think about microcredit programs to enable them to, mm. to do something with their knowledge and to integrate a society afterwards. This is a, a whole chain uh, which is uh, really yeah. important to, to And to it starts, work on. as Umra says, with self-esteem. You, you begin by establishing self-esteem, then you, you bring in education, then you know, down the road you bring in a you know, small-scale entrepreneurship, microfinance, etc. Exactly. So it is, it is a chain effect, isn't it, Umra? Absolutely. It's a holistic process. And I think the challenge is capturing the impact, which gets us a little in the way of experiencing the impact. So understanding, especially from the people who are supporting such initiatives, because we act from impulse of uh, humanitarian values. Uh, yet then you get to a stage where you're like, okay, let's prove what the results of what Dr. Katenya feels in his heart or what Sunita is doing out. And that's uh, where the kind of stumbling block is. And they are, they are lessons, aren't they? Because the ones that succeed and establish self-esteem and go on up the chain, uh, like Sunita, mm -hmm. empower others because they see it, people that are rescued, and you begin the whole process all over again. Absolutely, and that's what I mean by the impact of the impact is so much bigger than I think the initial acts. Like for me, being here is a result of something that happened 16 years ago mm -hmm. in the education, let's say, I had at the United World College. But then, you know, how would the UWC capture that impact and essentially what we're doing today with uh, Safari Doctors? Now, Tom, I mean, you, you, didn't, you didn't go into your humanitarian work, you know, for world acclaim and glamour, of course, but would you say that as an Aurora Prize laureate, do you think that these sort of prizes and recognition do have a role to play in, you know, building trust, awareness, uh, and creating continuity in what you're doing? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, the reason today that we are our hospital is still open is because of last year's Aurora Prize, uh, for various reasons. And I think part of the reason for this discussion, uh, we lost um, like 95% of our donors from last year, for reasons of, of report writing and other things that uh, we, we can talk about a bit later. Um, but because of the Aurora Prize, we're able to keep the the, the gates of the hospital open. Uh, one of the grants uh, went to buying all the drugs and supplies for this year, 2018, and through the publicity and through good friends of ours, uh, we're able to get money for, to, pay our, pay, to pay our salaries for our staff, which ends up being uh, $30,000 per month. Um, so without that publicity, uh, without the Aurora grant, we would, have, we would have had to close the hospital. And in that time, as you say, you've gone from 15 local staff trained to 230, and that is, too, an illustration of the continuity that the Aurora Prize uh, has brought, uh, you know, amongst, obviously, the, the good right. things you're doing. I mean, do you have problems, for example, with, you know, medical supplies? I mean, not just in terms of the finances, but in terms of operating in such a difficult environment, getting the supplies? Yeah, our, our biggest, when people ask me what our biggest challenge is, I don't say it's the medical conditions of the patient. Our biggest challenge is logistics, far and above every other problem. So we are way out in the bush, and uh, to get stuff from Nairobi or from Uganda up to us is incredibly expensive and very difficult. Uh, that's by far our biggest challenge, and I think that's not going to go away for a long time. Now, Umru, you were a CNN hero. I mean, do you also think that these awards or these designations that you, you receive, you know, not just for yourself, but help to publicize the work that you do and also give people pride, I suppose, and trust in, in the ability of, of you to sort of to help and to, to continue uh, in projecting, uh, you know, what you do? Absolutely. To echo um, what Dr. Katenya said and why we're all here today, I found it the fact that you have these initiatives that recognize the passion and the people behind what's happening. We were actually in the same predicament where we started off more as, a, I don't want to say hobby, because there's nothing super fun about it, that it's something that I could do from New York, you know, $500 a month, help uh, have a salary for a nurse and a motorbike to just go around. So that was the idea. And then CNN happened. And it's like, holy crap, reality sinks in that this could be something of much greater impact. And uh, for us, it was the same thing. We're able to get a team on board. We knew our medicines were secured for the entire year. We could put fuel on the boat. And then, more than anything, it's the credibility. Because fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of the work that we do is based on what credibility you have. And then everyone kind of starts jumping on board. So we cannot 
overemphasize the importance of such platforms. Um, Philip, is that credibility important for you uh, when you're as a donor? I mean, obviously the project is important in and of itself, but what about the people associated with it, the Umrahs, the Toms? I mean, how heavily does that weigh on you and your willingness to fund these and your willingness to sustain them and to keep them going? So we've taken over some very mature projects from the HNA group, um, but for them it hasn't played any role who was the donor. Mm -hmm. Certainly they've been very grateful, but they've been really focused on their specific project. Now the Sahang Foundation has not even the name of the h &A group in, so because they said, look, it's not to mix up with any activities we do in our day-to-day -day business, it's really to give back to society after a very successful business life. They are inspired by Buddha giving back to society and therefore they have called it Sahang Foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm not Chinese, though I'm looking Asian, mm -hmm. but it means somewhat in the translation like benevolence everywhere, which is their inspiration. Mm. So again, the question of credibility is more focused on the project. But Rather certainly than the individual, we use, you mean? Mm. Yeah, the international organizations, for example, because they have a lot of impact in the regions, if you would like, coming back to the question of system change, change the entire system. Because if UNESCO calls the Minister of Education in Myanmar, for example, or Laos, where they have uh, mm -hmm. this project, I think he will listen and will follow the invitation so what they did, and they changed the entire education system in terms of gender equality, for example. And I think this was only possible thanks to the high credibility and reputation of UNESCO in this region. Yeah, so you're talking about agencies having uh, credibility here as well as individuals. Yeah. But credibility is important for sustainability, for impact. Mike, would you agree? I mean, how important is it when you are looking to, to fund projects that you can identify an individual on the ground that's leading a Tom or an Umrah, or is it about agencies? How does it work in order to, to draw you in and to make you feel that this is a worthwhile project, as well as all the tick boxing and the evaluating that goes on? What about the personal element? It, it's basically only about personal. It's about uh, the trust that you have in this person and uh, the trust that you have in the capacity to, um, to achieve the goals that you are uh, really uh, combining with this person. So it's trust? It's trust, yes. And what makes you trust them? It's a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quantifiable necessarily. No, that's uh, the problem. It's not quantifiable. <laughs> what is it? Competence? Deliver they, they've got a record of delivering or you just, they're just a strong no, personality? It's, no, it's, it's a whole. It's, it's, of course, the personality itself, but it's also the concept uh, that the um, person develops. Yes. It's the program. It's uh, how and what they want to do. And uh, then uh, if you are convinced about it in a whole, uh, then, then you can uh, go and invest in the project. So how do we achieve sustainability, Tom? How, how do we achieve, I mean, I know you said that in your, in your work it's quite easily measured. It's by how many operations you carry out, how many, what your, your, the pool of people that you can help is. But, but think a little bit wider than that, because obviously you, you, you have very specific uh, experience, but you've, you've, you're in this world. What do you think more broadly? Well, I think in terms of sustainability, we're a, we're a church organization and, and we as the hospital and the, and the clinics and the schools, we're part and parcel of the people there. So our outlook is long term, 50, 100, 1,000 years. We want to be there running this hospital and expanding it. So um, we're not there for a one or two year project. We suck up the budget, then we take off and abandon ship. So our, a lot of our focus is on training. When we started out, we just did all, all on-the-job training. Uh, then we moved into sending people out for, for schooling. So uh, now maybe about 30% of our staff are trained nurses, trained clinical officers. We got three guys in medical school. So long-term sustainability depends on training your staff, mm -hmm. having a fully qualified staff. Uh, second part is making sure the money comes in. And uh, this depends on, as all the other panelists have said, I think depends on relationships with donors. Uh, and you're very important to that. I mean, obviously, you're a laureate and you're a strong personality. And how much is your work going out to donors and making the case? Yeah, that's, that's about 90% of it. I think uh, a key ingredient here is you need to stick around. So if you're, you know, uh, you're blown in and blown out, you're there for your three-month stint, no one's going to trust you. Mm -hmm. Like, why would, they, why would they invest in you if you're coming in for your three-month deal and you go back and you, you brag about it? They want to see somebody that's, that's going to stick around. You're there for one, two, ten years. Okay, this guy's serious with the, with the work. He's sticking around. Let's, yeah. let's invest in this guy. And, uh, you know, one of the 
big problems I have with the big donors is you, you suck up so, much, so, so many resources in hiring people to account for everything and to write reports and this and that. Mm. You know, half of your, most of your money goes towards that business, yeah. hiring all these guys. We're, we're medical people, we take care of sick people, our job is easy. So the resources should be going for that. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Philip talks about UNESCO and the fact that this was a heavy hitter, if you like, could go in and, and make, a, make a project happen. But at the same time, you know, the downside is, I, I hate to think how many boxes UNESCO requires to be ticked before any project can be approved, but I'm sure there's a heck of a lot. Umra, what, what do you think uh, in terms of, you know, this, this question of big donors and, you know, how much uh, resources have to go in to satisfying big donors versus uh, the, the smaller ones that are perhaps easier to access for startups <coughs> and new organizations like, or fairly new organizations like yours? Yeah, totally to echo um, uh, what Tom is saying is that we right now not, don't realize that this impact and measuring um, our sustainability is a lot of resources uh, that we're talking of, like, you know, having a researcher on board or the logistics that go to that. I'm a firm believer of local solutions for local problems. And what we have is we actually see we're able to gain a much bigger milestone in addressing community needs when we get this unconditional support that comes in, however small, versus the large grants which have us spending more time on the technical aspect of, uh, of operation. And we really underestimate that, although the humanitarian index, Aurora, shows us that there's a lot of trust in local NGOs, but yet that's where we put the least resources in uh, local NGOs. And the demands of accountability really underestimate the outcome um, that we're able to facilitate. So it would be interesting to see the shift in narrative as far as capturing output is concerned, investing in personnel, like what Dr. Katenya said, we're a service-driven institution, but yet donors want to see like more money go into programming as opposed to hiring a nurse or getting the medicine. So I would strongly question what um, where the line is between a donor agenda and the actual um, outcome of what's happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. Philip, what, what role does technology play in making impact sustainable, do you think, in this day and age? Yeah, that's quite relevant because still we're working with the classical institution, what you mentioned right now, but at the same time we would like to find out some very new, even tiny foundations and they are focusing on technology, and they are using technology in areas, for example, refugees, where they have not been used before, but where they can be very helpful. We all know, we have even discussed before the question of identity, for example. One of the major things for refugees to get it back mm -hmm. in identity. So we are working together with big data companies, and they have the idea to use their technology to bring them in to create First, identity, based on the identity, by the way, later on payment systems so that they can be part of market system mm -hmm. and start, for example, an Yes, because without an identity, they can't work, they this can't do anything. for mm -hmm. everything. So that is one thing. Some are using even technology, we just discussed it, that in some regions, I don't want to mention the countries, but refugees are not allowed to send their children to school. Mm. It's not that public, but because they don't want to be too attractive for refugees. But there are a foundation around, it's called Teach the World, and they bring in at least some kind of tablet PC so that they have an app on this. They can so they're bringing them into the camps, into the, the tablets, camps, the PCs, to enable them to get some them, special yeah. tents mm -hmm. so that kids mm -hmm. can into the camps so and have a couple of hours because there it's interactive. to use yes. this exactly and learn at least basic, some language, mathematics, and so on. It's not optimal, certainly. It's not comparable to any school, but it's more than nothing. It's better, then, isn't it, than exactly. what the alternative... And we saw in the video the little boy in Afghanistan who watched the others with their school bags and their books exactly. and, and couldn't go to school. Yeah. And how sad is, is that? It's yeah. tragic. And at the same time, it's good because someone spoke before about the donors across the world. And sometimes we're struggling with the nice guys in, in the Bay Area, even to explain them that there's a country outside the Bay Area, <laughs> and there's a whole universe outside, and there's so, many, so much humanitarian need. And now they realize this, and there are some smart Silicon Valley guys, yes. startup teams, they created a company called Reboot Camp, and they want to reboot bring in, camp. Reboot camp, not to mix up with the U.S. Army reboot no, no. camp with C. Reboot. Yeah, so it's a, <laughs> and they want to bring in container with coding equipment to train refugees in some areas coding because they said, look, train a kid coding, mm. they will 
never suffer hunger. No. Maybe it's very enthusiastic, but at the same time, it shows that you can use technology and the tech guys even to engage them in the humanitarian world. Yeah, and I think coding has been identified as the number one skill that this generation and the next generation needs, speci specifically because of the coming of artificial intelligence. Um, Mike, now your foundation received a grant from the Aurora 2016 Laureate as one of the designated organizations. Now, this is the idea um, that the Laureate continues the cycle of giving, um, creating impact. I mean, would you say that this does help to create a more sustainable system? Definitely, yes. It, uh, this Tell us a, about your own experience with that. Yes, it, is a, it was a unique experience for us because normally the relationship between the foundation and the NGO on the ground is more a, a one direction. Uh, we give the finance and uh, we, we work with them and they're doing the, the job on the, on the field. Getting now funds due to them in the, in the opposite way is a very new experience and uh, it allows us to, to be able to do new pro projects even with the partner or even with other partners which enlarges Mm -hmm. uh, very directly our, our sc scope of, of action. And I think this is really in the spirit of the Sustainable Development Goal, uh, goal number 17 of the UN. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, you're actually now working to create multi-level partnerships. Tell us about that. Yes, this, um, this the 17th goal of the UN is um, really promoting partnerships between all the, the, the players. Uh, on the governmental level, on the, the private business uh, level, but also on the uh, NGO level. And um, you see, for instance, I'm, uh, in my job I am confronted uh, often with the corporate social responsibility policies of, of companies. Of various if, companies, yeah. And if you see, the, the big companies are installing now in their organization social business units. Um, where they put their, uh, technology, uh, their technological uh, skills and their management skills uh, together with the experience with NGOs to create something new in their own structure. And this is really what uh, the, 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 the aim of the 17th goal. And presumably uh, through uh, to what Philip was talking about, not just to the NGOs, but beyond that to creating entrepreneurship in refugee communities, for example. Exactly. Exactly. Exporting, because one of the, uh, one of the fields of the 17th goal is the, the transfer of technology. It's not only finance, it's technology, it's, it's also about trade, but the transfer of technology in terms to enable uh, the NGOs to, to, uh, to fulfill their sustainability goals is very important in this case. Now, Tom, the um, Aurora gives the laureates the opportunity to, to donate a million dollars to um, a number of, uh, of origins, you know, organizations of your choice, and they're called desig a designated organization. Uh, tell us a bit about one of your um, designated organizations and, and how that has helped to sustain and spread the impact of what you do. Uh, well, I guess I think one example I could use is uh, with Catholic Medical Mission Board, um, they established an Aurora Fellowship, and the idea behind this was to, they would sponsor one person uh, to go out and do work similar to what we're doing in the mountains. So the first Aurora Fellow was named this past year. He's currently in South Sudan. That's a doctor. Is doctor, it a, me a medical, medical doctor. Yeah. Right, so I think this is a so really good... they go good out, and they spread the reach of what you're able to do. Right, exactly. I think this is a very good sort of medium to long-range uh, solution. Long-range long solution, obviously, is train people from the local area, and we're, we're working on that now, but that's going to take... 10, 15 years mm. to get that up to speed. So it's a good sort of medium-term solution. Uh, Umrah, what do you think? I mean, uh, how you can work, if, if you have the ability to, you know, uh, create a partnership with other organizations, have you done that yet? Are you still quite young in, in your experience of this, or is this your aim? How could it help you? I think for us, it's more than organization, but the community and the people around us, especially the young uh, women, as a Muslim woman from this conservative setting mm -hmm. and us addressing some of the taboo issues, I feel like our strongest agency is actually in mobilizing the, the young men and women to go back in the community. So coming up with localized solutions. Um, my favorite proverb uh, is when we share, you know, like we can make the ripple effect is, you know, if you think you're too small to make a difference, then you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. And that is 
really our philosophy as far as the partnerships that we engage on immediate contact with who we work with. As for bigger entities, we're at that level and that requires, you know, what we're talking about is how do we quantify what we're doing in order to justify these uh, bigger partnerships that we can engage. So what you're talking about when you talked about young women and, and youth, are you talking about sort of challenging the ethics of medical practice in, in Kenya? Are you challenging the way things are done? Uh, what, what, do you, what do you mean there? It's to shift the paradigm of access to healthcare. In Kenya and in Africa as a whole, we have 70% of our population that's in rural areas, yet healthcare access is in centralized regions. So you won't have a mother leaving her three kids in order to get like her three-month-old vaccinated $30 away. So it's how do we shift the paradigm of having really localized solutions to healthcare that's um, training the young um, agencies on basic issues that uh, affect the communities, whether it's it's diarrhea, you know, whether it's an outbreak. So how do we equip um, localized agents in accessing health? Because we're trying to prevent people from needing to see Dr. Katenya. Yeah. <laughs> so Very low primary level. level. Yeah. Okay, so we've heard from the panelists about uh, the Aurora Prize, how it enables uh, through the designated organization sustainability and impact to spread out. We've heard about the role that technology is going to play. We've heard about multi-level partnerships. And I think those are all really, really positive things because we've heard some, some pretty uh, distressing uh, um, things in terms of what's going on in the world, although the inspiring individuals uh, who are determined to challenge it, many of them are sitting in this room today. So thank you to the panel. And now, for me to introduce to you Nuba Afehan, the founder and co-founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering. You're a scientific innovator. Nuba, you're a professional entrepreneur and philanthropist, and you are, of course, one of the co-founders of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, and I'd like you to come and address some remarks to close our session today. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. I know you've been resilient to last till the very end. And uh, I was asked to make some closing remarks, but that were pertinent to the session, which I could not attend, uh, except for this last part, in, in all honesty. Uh, I, had, I had two other parallel commitments uh, that were on this topic happening at the same time. So my comments will not be uh, summary thoughts. They will be what is called afterthoughts. Uh, and you can do with them as you wish. Uh, but they're hopefully relevant. Uh, you've heard a lot today about the notion of gratitude in action, which really is driving uh, what Aurora is doing. Uh, this is a notion that we hope will compel lots of people to get engaged with this type of activity. And, of course, the gratitude part of that statement is the impulse, and the action part of that statement is the impact. And we've thought a lot about what is it about gratitude that gets people to, to act. Uh, it's not a word we often hear um, and, and use uh, to compel people. I, um, not being a professional in the humanitarian world or even for the philanthropy world, come from a very different world, but I do think that words matter. And I've thought a lot about what compels people to get engaged in uh, providing uh, either volunteer services or, or financial support to such important humanitarian crises that you're hearing about. And certainly, pity is a, is a factor in it. Lots of people will show the actual dire situation. And of course, the problem is we as humans have a way to shut down negative thoughts pretty quickly. And while pity will work for a little while, unfortunately, at least in, in the minds of lots of people, you kind of become resistant to that, and it doesn't become a sustainable impulse, at least from my point of view. You can also look for kindness. Uh, there's a lot of kind people in the world. Uh, it's uh, difficult to find them. Uh, and, and it turns out that they don't represent the kind of resources that are needed for this problem. And, and at least in our work, what we found is that a much broader universal feeling, especially among people who've benefited from the help of others, uh, survivors being the extreme version of that. If you owe your life to, this, to the action of others, uh, boy, do you feel compelled. Uh, to, to kind of have a, you're filled with this endless sense of gratitude, 
Uh, all you have to do is to go to a hospital. I live in Boston, and there's probably a thousand hospitals within a few blocks from where I am, or at least it feels like it. These hospitals are absolutely filled on the walls with names of very grateful patients whose lives were saved by doctors. Now, the question is, what is that feeling? And I think all of us are the beneficiaries of some sort of intervention that helped us achieve or survive. And that sense of gratitude, I would suggest, just for your consideration, is a far more sustainable source of engagement than simply finding generosity. I think it's compelling. I think it's renewable. And, and, and the more one achieves, the more one can feel a, a debt of gratitude that can then get converted into the most needy. And the more that, that provides impact, the more I think uh, 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 it will, it will uh, certainly spread. At least that's our hope. And, and, and it may seem a little too formulaic, but I do think that we should all collectively think about how to get the impulse of gratitude to, to be directed to this side. Just saying thank each other, thank God, thank, but it, the question is, can you put that thankfulness into action? So that's one general thing. The second point I'll just make, again, I'll keep it within the few minutes that I have, is that, you know, we've heard a little bit about SDGs, the 17th one. There's a whole 17 of them, and these 17 SDGs are totally meant to transform the world. Uh, they go from hunger and poverty to water to, to, to many other uh, gigantic unmet needs and health and governance, etc. And of course, if you look at them all together, you would conclude one thing, which is that uh, true to form, the countries that assembled to form this in the United Nations uh, are expecting a completely extraordinary result. Achieving these SDGs, I think, would be a remarkable feat. And yet, if you look at how we go about doing a lot of these things, we look for projects that are completely reasonable projects done by completely reasonable, credible people. And the question I would simply ask you in this domain is, how can we expect extraordinary results from the work of reasonable people doing reasonable things? And therefore, I think we need to find, in whatever we're doing, extraordinary, unreasonable approaches and find from them which ones can actually bridge the gap between the present reality and what it is the person envisions could be possible. And what you've heard from the, certainly the laureates, the, 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 the finalists in this prize and many others, is a, uh, a proof point that just by doing completely reasonable expected things, this is not going to happen. So I would simply urge those of you who are in the solution business not to look for solutions only among reasonable people and reasonable proposals. This may sound a little weird because we have committees of people that judge the reasonableness of proposals, but I come from the world of scientific innovation, I can tell you this. In the scientific innovation world, the disruptions, the, this, this, this device and many others that the cures for cancer, etc., by definition, do not start their lives being reasonable. And yet we look for reasonable solutions to these things. So I'll just ask you to think about that uh, dilemma as well. Uh, I'll end there. There's a lot of, the, the, I'll end with the dilemma though that I perceive in the work we do here, which is this notion that there's no absolute way to measure impact. There are relative ways. There are very specific, case-specific ways. And I really do look forward to the day. Maybe there's an innovator in the room or, or anywhere in the world where we could find a way to ascribe value to the impact and the result of what we're doing in this sector that allows us to make choices between approaches, between causes, between etc. that can, we can learn from, get better at. And if those of you are sitting here saying, boy, does he sound like a private sector person. Um, I am a private sector person. And rather than abandoning all hope, that the way we think about where we allocate resources in our time, that that simply doesn't apply. I think there are technological solutions that over time will allow us to measure the actual impact of things. And when that happens, even more gratitude will flow into action in my view. So those are my comments. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Nubar, and thanks to everyone who's taken part today in what have been a series, I think, of very interesting and thought-provoking sessions. And thank you to you in the audience for listening and, and, and willing everybody on. And we've certainly heard a lot today on our themes, 
inspire, empower, and impact for the Aurora Dialogues 2018, and will lead on to the celebration of the work of this year's Aurora Laureates after this. Now, for those who are interested, there, there will be a tour of the Matenda Ran, I hope I pronounced that right, beginning very shortly in 15 minutes, and it'll take about 40 minutes. After that, buses are going to take you to Tumo for the evening reception, which starts uh, at 1700, and I wish you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>